All right, guys, welcome to Flop Oriana's MMA show. I'm your host, Flop Oriana, brought to you by Four Corner Sports. All right, guys, so what's it called? This past Saturday, all right, we concluded USC 266. That's in the books. And guys, USC 266 isn't going to be remembered for quite some time. I don't know if it was the best card of the year because they still got... UFC 261 up there. You got UFC 259 around there. You can even throw in, uh, what's it called? The pay-per-view I can't remember off the top of my head. I believe it was uh, 265. That's when Dustin and Connor fought one another. But maybe that would be like at the bottom of the totem pole because of the fact uh, that co-main event was when Gilbert Burns and uh, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson really, you know, affected on how I rank. You know, best of best pay per views of the year, but wow, this one was pretty good, guys. But guys, I gotta say, please hit that like and subscribe subscribe button, guys, because that would really help out the channel, guys. We got to finally over a hundred subscribers, and that's really helped out the channel a lot. Thank you so much, and let's just keep on going forward. But moving on, all right. So, Alexander Volkanovsky versus Brian Ortega, all right? That was the main event. the The first fight of the card was. Uh, Jonathan Pierce versus Omar Morales. So from Jonathan Pierce and Omar Morales to Alexander Volkanovsky uh, versus Brian Ortega, guys, it was there wasn't really a boring fight on the card. And outside of maybe Curtis Blades versus Jarzino Rosenstrike, which we kind of saw that coming. But wow, the main event. The main event was one of the best featherweight fights I've ever seen in quite some time. And Volkanovsky, I think he finally got... His due diligence. He finally got, I believe, the respect that he needed. I think it was about time that the UFC put him in a main event. All right, because he has normally been in the co-main event. I was surprised he never fought in a main event on a fight night. It was the first time he ever fought in a main event, and he, he was a he was the the pre, what's it called the the main person to look at the featured. And uh, I'm glad. I'm glad that he got his uh, his his uh, comeuppance. So, Volkanovski was, was uh, facing uh, Brian Ortega, and there was a lot of tension. Obviously, these guys ended up having to be coaches against one another during uh, the Ultimate Fighter Season 29. It was the return of it. The last time they had it was in 2018. They bring it back for 2021, and we see what happens. I mean, was it the best Ultimate Fighter? No, it was not. But we were able to, we we were able to see why. Volkanovski and Ortega really didn't see eye to eye with one another. And man, I mean, Volkanovski really didn't like him, but he was trying to sell the fight and it was working. You know, I was very surprised. You really don't see that from a uh, an Alexander Volkanovski getting so heated, you know. And then it was bringing up the fact that uh, at one point Ortega ended up popping for steroids. That was in the very beginning of uh, his UFC career. And I'm sure he doesn't take that those type of supplements anymore. But, I mean, we were like, oh, okay, we didn't see this from Volkanovski. Uh, Volkanovski comes from that City Kickboxing uh, Academy in, uh, what's it called, New Zealand. Uh, head trainer is Eugene Berriman. You know, obviously, you know, Israel Adesanya is part of that camp. Dan Hooker, who was also um, on the card. And phenomenal work by Dan Hooker. But, uh, yeah, Volkanovski was a real deal. And then Brian Ortega, one of the best, what's it called, walkouts I've seen from a UFC fighter coming out to the purge with everybody wearing their face mask of, of the purge and the whole theme and the, the neon lights. It was awesome. I really loved, would love to see the UFC do that more often, allow their fighters to show more personality, show more expression. We are going to be able to understand who they are just because of the fact that, look, baseball is struggling because they can't really, you know, display personality and stuff like that. All right. UFC, we get a little bit more gist of it because of the, the trash talking, like what Connor does. Um, we get it to see like the the Sean O'Malley's of the world and stuff like that. And Ortega was able to display a little bit of his personality, you know, representing LA, you know, throwing the LA the LA sign. I'm wearing my Lakers hat, my my Lakers uh shirt because I'm a Brian Ortega fan and that and I'm just trying to proudly represent him the best way possible because I don't got a T-shirt of him. But yeah, I was disappointed when he ended up losing. Um, didn't really agree with the judges' scorecard. I mean, what's it called? Two judges didn't even give him a round. One judge gave it 
I was just like, whoa, I don't know about 50-44. But, man, I mean, I had Ortega winning one round, questionably, possibly even two rounds, just depending on who, um, on, like, what exactly are you looking uh, in a round. But, yeah, no, I would say round three, very questionable, just because, like, Ortega had it, you know, with the knockdown and then going for the guillotine choke and going for the triangle chokehold. Um, but but then Volkanovski answered back and just throw a veracity of punches and just throwing flo- floors, uh, you know, stacking his opponent against the, the cage and then just hammering down, 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 down. And then Ortega, you know, towards the, uh, at the end of the round, he needed to get helped up by his team to get back onto the stool and they had to like shock him with water so he could you know wake up a little bit but from round round one you know Volkanovski was just playing a, a, a very technical sound game round two there was a headbutt by Volkanovski and that impacted the fight but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna use that excuse as for why Ortega lost Ortega just got beaten down you know, the ground game was, even though the jiu-jitsu is his bread and butter, Volkanovski was just, like, very anti jujitsu. you know, with his wrestling and his grappling, which allowed him to get into flurries where he was able to display ground and pound. And, man, you know, Ortega just ate a be- just got a beating on the floor. And i just never seen anybody do that to Ortega. We've seen Max Holloway fight uh, Brian Ortega. And Max Holloway is one of the best, you know, fighters in the world. You know, regardless of division, and he's also one of, something that people don't really talk about. He's one of the best defensive fighters in the world. All right, and we saw what Max was able to do. You know, he used his offense to display for his defense, but we, but we also ended up seeing how he didn't allow Ortega to rely on his uh, first option or even his second option when it came to fighting. And Volkanovski, even though he got taken down to the floor, he was able to show, hey, I can get out of these type of moves, especially in the third round where we thought, uh, the whole world thought that Volkanovski was in a tap out because that guillotine choke was tight. And even Volkanovski said it was tight. Tight to the point where you see Volkanovski's legs were shaking. You know, sort of like when somebody, you know, is put in, in an uncomfortable position and they're struggling trying to get out. Well, Volkanovski was just managed to find like the slightest of gap openings to get out of that guillotine choke hold. And just allowed himself to wiggle out. And somehow he was able to get out of it. But yeah, so it was an incredible fight. Um, Volkanovski just showed why he should be respected more often. I get the fact that many of us, including myself, felt like Max Holloway won the second fight. But I think we also forgot, hey, Volkanovski, there's a reason why he's won 20 fights in a row. And that's something that doesn't get talked about a lot. 20 fights in a row, his only loss when he was at welterweight, and it wasn't in the UFC. The man has has d- jumped down division by division by division. He found his home in featherweight, and he dominated. Look at the guys that he ended up dominating and, and beating. Chad Mendez, Jose Aldo, Max Holloway, Brian Ortega, all right? Those are four featherweights, all right, who at one point have either either held gold or they eat, or they have competed for gold. And those are the best of the best. Now, obviously, there is a fight on November 13th between Max Holloway and Yair Rodriguez. I imagine the winner of that gets the title shot against Alexander Volkanovsky. Now, me personally, Max Holloway does not need to take a, uh, take that fight whatsoever. But stylistically, I think that's a nightmare of a matchup for Yair Rodriguez. I don't think Max is going to smoke him. And we haven't seen Yair fight since that Boston fight night card. When he w- when he was fighting guys uh, Jeremy Stevens, so it's a lot to come. Featherweight looks great. We have Giga Jakasi coming up. Um, what's it called? Josh Emmett should probably be you know back returning to the scene. You know either the beginning of January or like close to like March or something something like that. You know after he ended up like tearing every ligament in his knee and that fight between him and Shane Burkles. But yeah, Featherweight looks awesome. Uh, co-main event, we had Valentina Shevchenko versus Lauren Murphy. There's not really much to say here. Uh, Lauren Murphy was trying to hype up the fight, trying to uh, trying to make it seem like if uh, Valentina looked anything like human, that it should be an embarrassment because who? Because Lauren Murphy, of all people, ended up doing that to Valentina. Well, Valentina looked anything but um, anything other than human. She was a mercenary. She was in the octagon. 
um, what's it called? I understand some people don't like the way that she fights just because it's very technical, but also in the same aspect of like, we have to start learning how to value and appreciating these fighters just because there's very few fighters like a Valentina Shevchenko who could just dominate and clean the division. Yes, we have Amanda Nunes in the Bantamweight and the Featherweight division, all right? But Valentina has been, I, this is why she's personally one of my favorite female uh, fighter is because she's very active. You know that she's going to end up fighting at least two, maybe three times a year. And she will always keep herself active enough. So there comes to a point like, hey, all right, she cleaned out the division, the, the division, who's next? All right. She's always doesn't care. She doesn't, she never really cares who she has to fight. She just knows, okay, I have to fight her. No problem. And that's what it was against Lauren Murphy. Lauren Murphy really didn't have no answer whatsoever. She tried doing like a Superman punch. And that was just like very idiotic in my opinion because she left her feet and Valentina was able to attack in areas where Lauren Murphy wasn't going to be able to, to defend herself. Because once you leave your feet, once your feet leave the air, uh, the ground and now they're in the air, there's very little for you to do to defend yourself. And I saw Lauren Murphy try to, you know, throw maybe like three or four Superman punches. And each time that she did that, by the time her both feet had hit the floor, uh, Valentina ended up throwing like a two or three piece combination and Murphy ate it all. So phenomenal work by Valentina Shevchenko. The fight ended in the in the fourth round uh, by TKO, by punches. And it was just as expected as possible. You know, Valentina gets it done. Now, what's next for her? Who knows? I mean... It would have been great, you know, because Cynthia Calvillo and uh, Jessica Andrade ended up fighting. She got past Jessica Andrade in the second round in uh, the UFC 261. But but uh, Andrade ended up beating uh, Cynthia Calvillo. So there's not really much to be said after that. Who knows? Maybe the winner of Joanne Caldwell versus Alexa Grasso. But that's, I mean, Valentina has pretty much cleaned the division. Wouldn't be surprised if somebody from 115 comes up to try to challenge her. But that's just my opinion right there. Um, yeah, guys, middleweight, third fight of the, of the pay-per-view card, Nick Diaz versus Robbie Lawler. Now, look, a lot of people were waiting for this matchup. A lot of people were part of the Nick Diaz army. I wanted to see a Nick Diaz fight. Last time he got fought was in 2015. All right, last time he had won, I was in high school. Okay, so it's been a, it's been a while since he last won. And he was facing Robbie Lawler, who last time we ended up seeing him, he ended up uh, going against uh, Colby Covington in Newark, New Jersey, where Covington ended up dominating him. And that uh, that gave him the the title shot to go face Kamaru Usman for his first title defense. Now, former welterweight champ uh, Robbie Lawler goes against Nick Diaz. It was originally supposed to be a welterweight matchup, but it ended up getting pushed to middleweight because Nick Diaz has a lot of leverage. The Diaz, the Diaz brothers, you know, have that tandem of like, hey, we can control it being from welterweight to middleweight. We, we, if we want it to be th- uh, five rounds, we'll make it five rounds, and the UFC just obliged. But just everything that I saw from Nick Diaz, you know, from the lead up of fight week, it just didn't look very appealing. You know, the the interview by Brett Okamoto, guys, if you have the if you haven't seen the uh, interview, please watch it. Nick Diaz looked like he didn't want to be there. He looked it looked very alarming. And um, I just leading into the, the week, I was like, Robbie Lawler's going to win. Law- Lawler's going to win by knockout or TK on the third round. And I picked it. And I got it right. I, I should have honestly betted, but I didn't. Okay. And Lawler looked phenomenal. You know, he looked ready to go. Training with his guys from, from a Sanford MMA. Training with Derek Brunson. Training with Gilbert Burns. Training with Vincente Luque. Killers. Okay. Killers. Maybe not Derek Brunson, but uh, Burns and Luque, definitely. But yeah, uh, Lawler, I mean, Nick, Nick Diaz was just throwing punches, just throwing volumes of punches, but didn't really have much power behind it. And he was just touching Lawler. But Lawler kept a, a good frenetic pace to the point where he ended up just breaking down Nick Diaz and he ended up hitting him right dead straight in the nose in the third round, dropping him. And then it just seemed like Nick Diaz gave up and then it was it. It was over. They waved the white flag. Uh, what's it called? Robbie Lawler and his team ended up winning. They... Robbie, Robbie Lawler ended up improving to 29 wins, 15 losses with one no contest. And Nick Diaz, you know, reaches double digits in losses, 26 and 10. But yeah, uh, do I do I think we see Nick Diaz fight again? I heavily feel like no. If so, if we see him fight, maybe it'll be against a Cowboy Cerrone. And that would be the 
only other um opportunity i mean the only other um scenario i do see diaz fighting is somebody like a cowboy cerrone because what are you gonna have cowboy around in the ufc for he's already lost like what six fights in a row if you put him against nick diaz it'll be a very compelling fight but that's the only thing i can heavily think of as for robbie lawler i don't know this may have been his last fight i mean he has said in the past he really doesn't have you know it's been hard for him to get out of bed getting motivated to get into the octagon and wanting to fight somebody and nick diaz was one of those guys that got him out of bed you know motivated to fight somebody so i don't know may, this may have been the last time we've seen robbie lawler as well like i said before curtis blaze versus jarzinho um really there's not much to talk about uh curtis blaze won in a very boring fashion people were booing people were uh, very pissed off about how this fight was and it was just i believe it was in the third round or second round where jarzinho had an opportunity to put the fight away through a flying knee as if he as if he thought he was jorge masvidal and it almost ended up shutting the, the right eye closed of Curtis Blades. Outside of that, there's nothing really to talk about. Jessica Andrade versus Cynthia Gavillo. Uh, Andrade ended up just, you know, hammering away, throwing body punches and just wailing, you know, shots to the body and to the face of Cynthia Gavillo, forcing the ref to stop the fight in the first round. Uh, we, in the main car, in the prelim, the feature prelim, we had uh, Marab Dijvalavili versus Marlon Marais. Excellent fight. One of uh, me personally, that must have been the round of the year. Marlon Rice. I personally feel like if there was a fight that only lasted a minute, this guy might possibly be undefeated. But the fact that there are five minute rounds, all right, this guy blew the gas tank inside of the first give or take three or four minutes, and he had every opportunity. It was most likely going to be a 10 8 round the way that everything was going, maybe even a 10 7 round. Marlon Marais had Marab hurt and in a way that I've never seen Marab hurt in this fashion. And Marab was running around the, the octagon just trying to buy time, trying to recoup himself. He got knocked down to the floor, was falling backwards, you know, landing, you know, holding onto the cage, trying to run away from Marlon because Marlon was just throwing flurries and hitting him with everything but the kitchen sink. And then well, as soon as Marab ended up, you know, get, getting a grip of uh, Marais, throwing double underhooks and then throwing him down for a takedown i was like that's it it's over marab is gonna smash and ground and pound away marlon rice and then it came to the point where we saw about close to 110 unanswered strikes by marlon rice i mean by uh, marab de Joalavilli, where marice was not defending himself whatsoever i don't understand why keith peterson did not stop the fight after seeing 110 compl uh what's it called consecutive shots and man at some point it was like all right enough enough is enough they stopped the fight and you know almost finishing the second round and marab ends up improving to 14 and 4 um marlon you know goes down to 23 and 9 but it was so devastating for marlon because you know most referees would have stopped the fight that first round and i would have never blamed key peterson to stop the fight but he gave marab an opportunity to at least try to defend himself and when he saw that Mar Marab was able to survive the onslaught of Marlon. Man, we just saw one of the best rounds of, of the year, and that was round one. Now, who wants to fight uh, Marab? I have no idea. This guy is dangerous. This guy is the machine for a reason. You know, this guy has great wrestling. He can he can strike with you, and he will smother you. At, at 135, I have no idea. The only person I could possibly think that he might be able to wanting to fight is, you know, he's going to want to shoot up, but realistically maybe he fights like a frankie edgar the winner of frankie edgar versus marlon chido vera maybe we see him fight uh dominic cruz who knows but you know the stock on marav is high and not too many fighters want to fight him and i certainly don't blame them but that's just my take all right guys that covers the recap of usc 266 thank you for tuning in please hit the like and subscribe button guys and let's get these subscribers all the way up to 150 and let's see where it takes us from there until then guys I am Flavio Oriana. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace, guys, and have a good one.